Hello, let's look at the newly installed Kogo bike share system in downtown Columbus and the surrounding area. Within the first two months of operations, Kogo expanded to have 30 stations with 300 total bikes in the system circulating. There were 2,500 trips in the first two months with over 57,000 miles traveled. The premise of this bike share program is quite simple and is spelled out as a step-by-step -step process on their webpage and at their rental kiosks. When you first walk up to a Kogo bike share station, you will see three things. First, and probably the most obvious, you will see a line of bikes docked at their station. Then you will see a computerized kiosk. And lastly, a map. Let's start by looking at the map. Right away, we can see that the positioning of the map is not ideal. It is facing the row of bikes and is very close to the first bike in the row. This makes it so that no matter where a person is standing, some of the view of the map will be obstructed by the bike. There's also a great deal of glare coming off of the protective layer on top of the map. Both of these things combined cause the user to have to move around the physical obstacle of the bike to have a clear line of sight at the portion of the map they wish to see, as well as positioning their eyes to an angle where they can see without glare. Here we see a print of the same map that is displayed at each Kogo station. It has the locations of all of the other Kogo stations marked, as well as some popular bike trails and two locations to purchase helmets. You have to assume that the symbol of the white circle with a red bike in it is representing the bike share station as the symbol is not listed in the legend in the upper left corner. Once we make that assumption, it is still difficult to spot where exactly the terminals are on this map, mainly due to the contrast and size issues. Adding to the poor contrast and size of the symbols is the glare from the protective case laying over the map. Here is an example of a simple solution to make the map more readable. The red dots with a black outline stand out against the gray background, and the legend lets us know that the red dots represent the terminal locations. Now let's look at the kiosks. At the top of the kiosk, there is some basic information and some brief instruction on how to use the system. It explains that it costs $6 for an unlimited 30-minute rides in a 24-hour window. Next, explains the process of renting a bike from one station and returning it at another before your 30 minutes are up. In the less pronounced print, some general rules and information are displayed. This information is good to know, but not necessary to successfully use the Coco bike share system. Below that is a touchscreen monitor. Displayed on the monitor are five options. Get a bike, request a new code, station full, print receipt, and find nearby stations. The most desired option, get a bike, has a button four times the size as the other options. This allows the system to give users all of the options that they want on one screen while still simplifying the process for those who want to do the standard process of getting a bike. Having a larger button will draw the attention to that option and will also decrease the fine motor error of pressing the incorrect button. Below the touch screen, we see a panel with four instructional steps and a credit card reader. The credit card reader is embedded within the first step, rent, which makes sense because that is the step during which the reader is used. Below the list of the four steps, there is a small slot with a label of member key reader. The location and function of this area is not obvious to an inexperienced user, but it is assumed that the average occasional user will not need this function as they are not members and that the members will be familiar enough with the system to know how to use it correctly. The member key reader is placed in a great location because most occasional users will not notice it and therefore it will not be confused by the option. At the bottom of the kiosk, about three feet off the ground, is a compartment in which the receipt that contains the rental code prints out. There is no direct instruction or prompt to take the receipt from the compartment. So if you are not familiar that you will need it for the rental code, you may not take it the first time. Now let's watch someone go through the process of using the kiosk to obtain a return trip ride code. For this process, it is not clear if he should select get a bike or request a new ride code. His end goal is to get a bike, but he chooses the option of requesting a new code. Then he proceeds to swipe his credit card. This step could be confusing unless you remember that step four from the instructional panel states that your card will not be charged again. After agreeing to some terms and conditions, 
He picks up the receipt from the compartment and is now done interacting with the computerized kiosks, he will move on to the row of bikes. The bikes are stored in individual locking decks spaced about two feet apart from each other. The keypad to unlock a bike is located on the vertical face on the dock to the left of the bike. On the keypad, there are three lights, a red, yellow, and green light, and three numbers, one, two, and three, along with a vertical slot for the member key. To unlock the bike, you must use the five-digit code on the receipt, print it out from the kiosk, and enter it on the three-digit keypad as shown on the pictorial instructions on the receipt. The three lights are labeled with an X above the red light, indicating stop, or that something did not work, a clock above the yellow light, indicating wait, and a check mark above the green light, indicating that everything is good to go. These symbols and colors match what the convention is for these actions. If you do not retrieve the receipt from the kiosk or do not see the code on it, the dock could very quickly become confusing. The vertical slot for member passes on the right is the same height as a credit card and could be mistaken for a credit card reader, especially since it is not labeled in any way. Now let's see the same person try to unlock a bike from the dock for the first time. He seems to find the keypad easily and proceeds to enter the code. A tone sounds after each digit indicating successful entry. He gets the green light indicating that he can remove the bike, but he cannot figure out how to remove it and looks around for additional cues. The dock sounds tones to signal that he needs to remove the bike and in a panic state, he finally figures it out. This must be a common issue because Kogo published short instructional videos about a month after the initial launch of the program. Here is one on how to unlock the bike. To get a bike out of the dock, you need to either use your five digit code or your key fob. You'll see a yellow light and then once you see a green light, you lift up on the seat and you pull out of the dock. Now that we have our bike, it is time to ride to our destination. I chose to ride from the 2nd and High Street location to the Convention Center station, which is a half mile southbound ride straight down High Street. The trip took me eight minutes from the time I got on the bike to the time I redocked it at the Convention Center. Upon arriving at the station, I realized it was on the northbound side of the street, so I'd have to somehow cross three lanes of traffic to get to it, as it was not at a standard intersection, causing a safety risk for myself and others, or find a different method to get to the other side of the street. I ended up having to go on the southbound sidewalk and then use a crosswalk to get to the other side, forcing me to break city code that bikes are not to be ridden on the sidewalks. After crossing the street, there was no ramp to get up the curb to the station, so I had to dismount the bike in the street, presenting a safety hazard to myself, and walk it over the curb. Now that we're at the station, it's time to redock the bike. Let's take a look and see how our first time user does this. He has put the bike back in the docking corral, but gets no indication that it is locked and secure, so he attempts to re-enter his rental code and leaves the unlocked bike as a theft liability. On a second try, with a little bit of instruction, he's able to successfully redock the bike and get the green light indicator that it is locked in place. Now that this riding experience is over, Let's see what he has to say about his first time using the GoGo Bike Share program. How did you? What did you like about your first experience using the GoCo bikes? It was pretty quick. Uh, not too many steps to take, I guess. Um, what about the checkout process to initiate? Uh, the checkout process was pretty obvious. There were only a few options to select from, so I just hit the button I needed and then swiped the card. Did you have any difficulties? Uh, I had some difficulties undocking the bike and actually docking the bike. Uh, 
when I undocked, it gave me a green light indicating that I was good to go. Uh, but then I pulled the bike and it didn't move. So I didn't know if I needed to enter my code again or if I wasn't pulling hard enough. Turns out I wasn't pulling hard enough, but I was sort of worried about breaking it since I didn't own it. Now that we've seen how the bike share program works, let's look at some potential pros and cons for the system. A significant con for the user is the expensive rate for the 24-hour pass, but with it comes the trade-offs of a maintenance-free biking transportation, um, readily available transportation, and unlimited trips with no parking fees. The pros for the company include the revenue that they take in from both the annual memberships and the daily um, rental passes, as well as that it's a self-operating system so they do not need to employ anybody to man the rental kiosks, and it's ecologically friendly, which is great for their PR. The negative trade-offs for those benefits are that the installation costs were very high because they had to do it all at once. They had to spend a lot of money on advertising as well because it was a new system to the community. They have to cover all repair costs for all bikes and public relations issues due to increased bike traffic on the roads for some people. The greatest trade-off for the community is that there will be fewer cars on the road, but in turn there will also be more bikes on the road. My suggestions for improvement to the bike share program is to change the map to be more accessible and more legible, have a verbal prompt alerting the user to take the receipt, have written instructions on the dock explaining how to unlock the bike, and to increase the time limit from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Also, potentially providing locks of the bikes and making stations more accessible with traffic laws. Thank you for watching. For more information, please go to cogobikeshare.com.